We'll pick up from where we left off last week. Uh, and so last week we know that Elijah and the false prophets of Baal are having this, this showdown, as we call it, on Mount Carmel. Uh, and Elijah has given the false prophets a task, and that is to take a bullock and to slay it and to dress it and to build an altar and to call upon Baal and ask Baal uh, to send fire upon the altar. And whoever, whosoever God answers by fire, Elijah says, that's the God that we should serve. And so in verse 28, we pick up tonight in verse 28 in the Bible reads, uh, and they cried aloud, and this is referring, they is, is referring to the prophets of Baal. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives. Notice, notice the cutting of themselves was after their manner. It's what they did. It's a custom that they had. It's a custom that the false prophets had. It's a custom that Baal uh, infused into them. It's a custom that was a part of demonic worship, uh, the cutting oneself. Uh, and so what did they do? After their custom, they cut themselves with knives and with lances uh, till the blood blood gushed out uh, upon them. So in verse 28, the, the, now you know is sort of uh, from last week that the, the false prophets had cried unto Baal uh, for a good portion of time. The Bible tells us from morning even until noon. At noon time, Elijah steps up and he begins to sort of mock them and say, well, why can't Baal answer? Is Baal answering the telephone? Is he peradventure going on a journey? Is he too busy to pick up the telephone? And so Elijah kind of has this smart aleck kind of edge to him a little bit. Uh, and and so after Elijah gets done speaking, uh, the, what happened in verse 28? And they cried aloud and cut them, and they cried aloud. So even though even though Baal had answered yet, five hours of seemingly morning till noon, uh, somewhere in there, five, so several hours have passed. Baal has not answered. Uh, Elijah has mocked them uh, in, the, in the previous text. And now in verse 28, what did they do? They cried aloud. So I think that they thought that their emotional response to Baal would somehow elicit his his approval like if we cannot get a hold of Baal just by calling him or just by talking to him or just by looking at the uh, up to or wherever we think Baal lives and, and saying Baal help us if we cannot get a hold of Baal with just simple prayer and simple uh, faith and then man we gotta cry aloud we gotta get real emotional we gotta stir up all of our emotions and we gotta cry aloud uh, to Baal now I would say first of all Jesus teaches us the very opposite opposite of this principle. That my prayer to God is not based on my emotional response in prayer. And I think that's very, very important. I remember they, I was at a meeting one time where they called upon people to, to pray. Uh, and they, they had several people pray. And one, one pastor prayed, and he prayed with a lot of emotion. Uh, and then another pastor prayed, and he prayed with a lot of emotion. They, they would hand the mic to different uh, preachers. And he prayed, the second preacher prayed, and he prayed with a lot of emotion. And then they handed the mic to me and they had me pray and because I saw the first two guys pray with a lot of emotion that I stirred up my preacher emotion I guess I guess I would refer to it as that and I began to pray like the people prayed before me uh, and, and, and it may have elicited a response in the crowd they may have thought man that's a powerful prayer but let me tell you this ladies and gentlemen emotionalism does not necessarily equal a powerful prayer amen especially if it's a stirred emotion or a copycatted emotion right? It doesn't necessarily equal power in prayer. What does equal power in prayer? Well, let me finish the story, I guess. So, uh, and finally they handed the mic to the next preacher and they said, we want you to pray for this, this, this thing. And he began to pray and I'll never forget it. And that's why it sticks out in my mind so much. He get, he started to pray in just a simple, a monotone, a calm voice. And I thought, man, it just stuck out to me because preacher one prayed with emotion. Preacher two, and I'm not saying this bad, I'm not saying emotion prayer is wrong. Don't get no. me wrong. But preacher two prayed with emotion. Preacher three, me prayed with emotion. And then the fourth guy realized that the, the answer to prayer does not lie in the in the volume of your voice. The answer to prayer does not lie in how much you can jump and shout and skip it and cry. The answer to prayer lies in your covenant with you and God. Amen. God can hear my whisper just as well as he can hear my shout. Why? It's not like my shout gets his attention more than my whisper. Why? Because I'm in covenant with him and he has agreed to be in covenant with me and he wanted to be in covenant with me and part of the agreement of the covenant is Jason, if you'll pray, I'll hear you. 
Yeah. Amen. Right. The righteous cry, the Lord heareth and delivereth them from all their troubles. Uh, 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 many verses over and over and over again about prayer uh, indicate to us that God desires to hear prayer and we don't have to necessarily stir up emotion in order to pray. Amen. Amen. Now, now I would say this to you, though. The, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So a fervent prayer. Uh, and by that, I don't mean that it has to be some prayer that's shouted. By that, I mean it has to be a prayer that comes from an intense place of the heart where you desire really to speak with God and to be heard from God and to be heard of God. Uh, in that, I'm not, so I'm not talking about a real... Uh, when I say fervent prayer, when the Bible says fervent prayer, I think it's referring to a prayer that is prayed from a place in the heart with, with love to God and not some religious just repeat a prayer and, and move on about your day. Are you everybody with me? Yeah. Now I'm not saying though that emotion is bad in prayer but what I am saying is you'll never stir up your emotions strong enough to elicit a response from God. God responds because God is good. Right. Not because Amen. you yell. Amen. 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 Brother Jason's kind of guilty sometimes of yelling and I get real excited real quick sometimes <laughs> but, but, but God God doesn't hear me because I yell. God hears me because God has God is good and He has agreed to hear me. Everybody with me? Amen. All right, let's turn really quickly over to John, uh, John's Gospel. I, I didn't tell my, uh, uh, my my wife that I was going to John's Gospel. I know that's exactly what she was thinking. Uh, she does the slideshows for us. She does such a good job, uh, and we appreciate it. But I forgot to tell her I was going over to John 14. So, excuse me, John 11. Uh, John 11, verse 41. I want you to see these verses. Uh, in verse 41. Uh, this is the scene at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus is there. Lazarus has been dead for four days. And in verse number 41, John 11, the Bible reads, And they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes. So Jesus looked toward the Father. He didn't say necessarily lifted up his voice, but he lifted up his eyes. Uh, what, what verse was that supposed to be? In verse 41, he lifted up his eyes and said, not he lifted up his eyes and cried with a ton of emotion. Not he lifted up his eyes and uh, shouted and then danced real strong and elicited a big emotional response. But he lifted up his eyes towards the Father and he just simply said. He begins to pray. Now this is prayer that Jesus is engaging in. He begins to pray. Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Now you, you no, no, what does he say? What does he tell us? He's saying something to the Father and he thanks God. God, that he has been heard by, he thinks the Father that he's been heard by him, which indicates to me that, that, that Jesus knew the power of his prayer was in the God who, the Father who hears, not the volume of my voice. And the false prophets, they kind of had it backwards, didn't they? They thought, man, if Baal hasn't answered all these days, then I guess we're going to have to get louder. But God doesn't need, if, 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 if he's the real God, he don't need you to get louder. He can hear you if you're seven, seven miles uh, uh, from anything. Hallelujah. He can hear you. Amen. He can hear a whisper. He can hear, he can hear uh, the, the voice of a tear that streams down your face and know exactly what it means. And it registers with him in heaven, not because you screamed it, but because he has chosen to be your father and you have chosen to be his son or daughter. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. So what Jesus said in verse 41, he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew, and Jesus says, and I knew that thou hearest me always. Praise the Lord. But because of the people which stand by, I said it. Not, not I screamed it, but I said it. And again, I'm not telling you there's anything wrong with, 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 with emotion and prayer. I'm just saying emotion does not elicit the response. God's goodness elicits the response. Amen. Amen. That they may believe that thou hast sent me. Now watch what happened in verse 30, 43. And when he, now when Jesus speaks to the Father, he says something. That's what it says twice in verse 41 and in verse 42. But when Jesus speaks to the dead man, watch what he says. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Uh, now, now what, what's my point? My point is uh, Jesus exhibited the emotion in the speaking to a dead man, not in the speaking to a living father. The living father doesn't need my elevated emotion. The living father does not need my elevated volume. The living father just needs a willing heart and a willing participant who's willing to speak to him and call upon him and ask him for help. What do you think? Now, there may be some dead people that need a uh, shout. 
Amen. Amen. There may be some dead yeah. Christians that need a shower. Yeah. They, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. There may yeah. be some dead Christians yeah. who are who are who are just about all oh, but backslidden and they need a good shout. Hallelujah. Yeah. And sometimes the preacher just needs to go ahead and shout a little yeah. bit. But 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 when you're praying to God, you don't have to be the, the listen to me, especially in Pentecostalism, uh, this this thing happens where if somebody prays with a lot of emotion, you feel like you gotta pray with a lot of emotion, and that is not true. Right. Amen. Amen. So let's go back over to First Kings twenty, uh, First Kings eighteen. <laughs> Amen. I guess I could belabor that point a little bit more, but I'll move on. First Kings eighteen twenty eight. Uh, I was driving down the road one time on M one forty, heading heading south on M one forty, uh, and, and, and a vehicle stopped, and I wasn't paying too good of attention, and it was icy outside, and it was wet and icy, uh, and it was bad conditions, and I and I he stopped, but I didn't see him. And by the time I saw him, all I had opportunity to do was slam on the brakes and say Jesus, Amen. And I just I didn't shout Jesus, I didn't dance, uh, I didn't do a praise dance. Uh, I just said Jesus, and guess what he did? He heard my prayer, not based on my emotion or the volume of my voice, but simply based on his love for Amen. me. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. All right, so let's go to 1 Kings 18, and we're going to look back at verse 28. So when Baal didn't hear them, they decided that they needed to cry aloud, get louder, speak with a lot of emotion, and cut themselves with, with their manner, cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. Now remember, they had already sacrificed the bullock. So the bullock has already shed his blood, and they already got blood on the altar, right? Because now they're praying for Baal to send fire down and consume the sacrifice. So there's already blood on the altar, but I think this, the devil, and I think you should, you should listen on this one, the devil loves a human sacrifice. Right. The devil loves human blood. Right. Uh, the blood of a bull uh, may be one thing, but the blood of a human being is something that the devil delights in. How do, how do I know that? Well, consider the first generation of the human family, Adam and Eve. Yeah. What did Adam do? He just took a bite out of an apple. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hey, or, or a fruit. Amen. He took a bite out of an apple or, or, or fruit. Hey, amen. Uh, he took a bite. And that, that's pretty simple stuff, right? I mean, that's not major, but what you would consider to be major rebellion. It's an inside joke for all of you apple users out there, me included. Uh, so, 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 uh, so he, he just took a bite out of the fruit, uh, and that wouldn't consider to be to be too major of a thing. Uh, but then, what happened in the second generation? By the time the second generation rolls around, what did the devil do? The devil inspired Cain to rise up and do what? Kill his brother. Can you imagine that? Why? Why does? Why does? How can the devil go from eating fruit? and inspiring one generation to eat fruit and getting the other to kill each other and draw blood because the devil loves a human blood sacrifice. Right. By the way, that's what the global abortion agenda is really all about right. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You, the, well, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Uh, when you see something in the natural, no, there's a there's a something triggered in the spiritual yeah. that causes people uh, to look at a baby just like a blob of molecules. Yeah, right. You know, just like a, a nothingness. Yeah. Right? Just like nothing. Just like they, they, without conscience. They've already decided that the baby inside the mother's room is not a human being. Uh, and, and it's glo a global initiative uh, to, to, to what? To draw out blood. To shed blood. Because right. the devil loves a blood sacrifice. Amen. What did the devil do here? Amen. What did he do here? He uh, inspired his the prophets of Baal uh, to cut themselves with knives and with lances till the blood gushed. Gushed. That kind of indicates it was a massive cut. Right. Massive cuts. Massive wounds. The devil loves to destroy the human being. Right. The devil loves to, 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 to destroy humanity. The devil loves to destroy the human body. Which is kind of why we would indicate that things that do destroy the human body are not necessarily probably things we should participate in. Right. Amen. So that's what the devil loves to do. Uh, and I, uh, okay. Praise the Lord. Go ahead. You know, we were made in God's likeness and in his image. Mm -hmm. And the devil can destroy that if he can get back to God. There you go. 
Amen. Right. Absolutely. He, lo he loves that human sacrifice. Uh, and, 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 so the, and the prophets of Baal knew that. Uh, but by the way, God also obviously knew that. Go with me to Deuteronomy 18. Uh, and, and we'll read a few verses over there. Uh, I got some of this ground to cover. I got to decide where all I want to go tonight. And that's another one I didn't tell the to tell my wife I was going to. Uh, I, got, I got to communicate that. Praise the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy 18 and, and verse number 10. Deuteronomy 18, verse number 10, and we're going to look at we're going to look at God's prohibition against witchcraft. Somebody said, "Does God really care if I do a poem reading?" Yes. Well, I don't feel bad about it. Well, that's because your conscience is dead. Right. That's because you read more of the horoscopes than you do the Bible. That's because right. you watch more TV than you do preaching. Right. That's why you don't feel bad about it. It's not because it's not wrong. It's because your conscience is seared. Right. Amen. That, that was just my that's just my little note. <laughs> Maybe a parenthetical insert, insert. Anyway, look at verse number 10. He, verse number 10, Deuteronomy 18. God's speaking about witchcraft. He says, uh, Deuteronomy 18 and 10. There should not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter uh, to pass through the fire or that useth divination. So I want to skip the first part of verse number 10 and just go right there to divination. I want to do that for a purpose. Then we'll go back to the beginning of verse number 10. He says, don't get, don't allow anybody to be found among you who gets involved in divination or divining or looking into a crystal ball or staring right. out into something or uh, bringing their mind to a contemplative slow state kind of like yoga but being bringing your mind <laughs> bringing your mind uh, to okay so we all get into maybe maybe some of y'all won't uh, but, but bring it but you know yoga comes out of, out of, out of, out of the hindu religion right yes, it, 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 okay so anyway let me not get involved too bogged down on that but 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 you don't see anybody in the bible doing yoga i just want to point that out to you okay right. yeah, yeah, amen amen, amen. amen. so we say well uh, <laughs> i just like the stretching you don't think you can stretch without doing yoga right all right Verse number 10, let me not just want to hey, I'm, I'm put that in there too. They, they shall not be found among you. Anyone that in verse number 10, passes the fire, and he says, uses a divination or an observer of the times that your horoscopes and your and your and, and amen, it's a stars aligning, and I'm a Libro and a Taurus and a Sagittarius, yeah. and, and I got my my, my Sag tat on my hand. Uh -huh. yeah. Come on. Come on! Yeah. Uh, wait, come on! I do not read. Some people read. Some Christian folk read more horoscopes than they do the Bible. They've been saved for twenty-five years and have not read the Bible through one time, but they read the horoscopes every day. Right. Amen. 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 Or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. So we're clearly talking about witchcraft, enchant, incantations, observing times, divination. Or oh, he says, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, that's somebody who talks to the dead. Right. Verse number twelve. For all these things, for all for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Uh, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them. Out out from before thee. Now, so what, what am I, what's my point? My point is Deuteronomy 18 verses 10 to 12 is clearly talking about witchcraft. Clearly talking about pagan religion. Clearly talking about the devil's religions and well, all these de the devilish false religions. Now looking back at the beginning of verse number 10, watch the first thing that God says is a part of demonic false religion. Verse number 10, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire. Right. What do you think is going to happen if you take your children and make them pass through the fire? Yeah, that you're sacrificing them. That's right. They're dying. Uh, in fact, if you, you can research it when you get home. But, but, but if you wanted to, maybe you shouldn't even. I don't know. But the point is this. God is saying, don't let anybody be in Israel that sacrifices their children on the altar of a pagan God. Uh, on the altar. So, so witchcraft and bloodshed and abortion uh, and violence and murder and war. War. Right. And by the way, did you know this? This is a good. This is a good fact, Amen. This is not fake news. President Trump is the first president since Jimmy Carter not to send new troops into foreign countries. Right. The first thing, what they say about him, he'll start a war. He'll get us in World War III. Yeah. They used to say that a ton of times. First president since Carter, yeah. then Obama, Bush, yeah. Bush the first, Bush the second. Yeah. All of them. The first president since Carter that did not send new troops uh, into. Foreign Foreign wars yeah. to inspire further bloodshed. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. So, Brother Jason, you for war? No, I'm not. I'm for peace. Right. Impossible. 
Now, if you have to get in war, then you have to get in war. But the point is, we don't, we don't go out and start wars. We want to bring our troops home and let them be with their families. We don't, right. come on, yeah. we don't want to be fighting endless wars in the Middle East. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. Good. Amen. Yeah. First President says Carter. Right. Look it up. They won't, they, won't, they won't report that on CNN. I'll guarantee you that or CNBC or, or ABC or whatever news people watch. Amen. They report all that. Uh, they, they, amen. Verse 29. Amen. That's why. That's one of the reasons why I like them. Because I don't, I'm not for war. Right. Especially continued endless wars that are never won. Right. If you're going to fight a war, go fight it and come back home. Yeah. Fight it, win it, and come back home. Right. But don't just send kids over there to die. Come on. You notice what politicians do? They send their kids over to foreign countries to make billions from Ukraine and China yeah. and Russia. Right. But they send our kids yeah. over to the foreign battlefield right. to die in war. Yes, sir. Come on. Amen. Yes. Come on. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's right. It's a true story. Yes, sir. Verse 29. Verse 20. Oh, uh, 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 first Kings 18. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> First Kings 18. Amen. I'm having a good time. I, I'm, ha I'm having a good time, not because uh, I like what's going on in our country, because I think it's a mess. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but I'm having a good time because I find stability in God's Word. <laughs> uh, and it, it's just, woo, it just brings me into joy, even when the world has no joy to give. God gives me joy to His Word. I love it. Amen. So, uh, 1 Kings 18, we're going to go to verse 29, and i got to hurry because there is somewhere I want to go with this lesson, and if I don't hurry, I'm not going to get there. Verse 29, and it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Now, i got two things to say. One, when I came into church tonight, it was cold to me. Right. So I turned the heat up, and I made a big mistake. It is really, really hot. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and so if somebody wants to tap that down a couple degrees from me, I really appreciate it. I feel like I'm in a sauna up here, man. <laughs> all right. And that was all my mistake. <laughs> all right. So, 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 so uh, but, but, but secondly, verse 29, and it came to pass when the midday was passed. So the, the, the false prophets prophesied and prayed and gushed themselves and cut themselves and shed human blood on the altar until at least midday and then they prophesied until the time of the offering of the sacrifice that there was near all of the offering of the evening sacrifice so these false prophets served Baal from morning until evening now now I can barely get people to attend one hour church a week and, and say, well, Brother Jason, this is China Bible study. Don't you know that? Yeah, I know that. And I'm not talking about people that are afraid, that are concerned about China virus. I'm talking about before there was ever a China virus. The most church we ever went to, some of us, was an hour. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It's tight, but it's right. Yeah. Uh, the most, most Bible we ever read was three verses in the morning. Uh, come on. Yeah. But we were watching the news and the, and the sports for hours yeah. a day and right. fishing hours a day and hunting hours a day. And yeah. Hours a day. Yeah. These bail, at least these bail, these bail prophets were extremely wrong, but at least they were committed. Right. These bail prophets were more committed to bail than we are sometimes to Jesus. Right. But we, amen, they were more committed to Ahab as king than we are sometimes to our own church. Right. Amen. That's yeah. right. That now Ahab, you know what Ahab was doing? Ahab was leading these people to the slaughter. Right. By, by the time this story's over, these 450 false prophets are going to be dead. I don't know if you guys realize that. Ahab is leading them to the slaughter. And by the way, this, this in this country, there's a whole lot of Ahabs leading people to the slaughter. Amen. That's for sure, brother. Amen. Right. You said, brother, brother Jason, are you going to keep on about that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Somebody ought to say something. Yeah. Amen. As long as I got a voice and before yeah. they shut me down, right. somebody ought to say something. You got to be careful who you follow. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's right. You got to be careful about a politician that'll send their kid over to Ukraine to make $2.5 million right. and to send your side right to die. You got to be careful. Right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. See, that's right. Amen. 
So they, they kept on prophesying. They were committed. These people were more committed sometimes than we are uh, to Jesus. You let one little thing go wrong and we're ready to throw in the towel. Well, let one little thing go wrong and somebody say something we don't like and we're ready to just quit serving Jesus and go down to the tavern. That's a bunch of nonsense. You know what? If I did that every time somebody offended me, you know what would happen to me? I'd have been out 15 years ago, man. I preached my first sermon that went okay. By the time I got preached my second one, my phone kept ringing for like a week with people hating on me. Right. It's true story. Right. Right. And I'm not even, I, if I had quit with everybody's attitude and everybody's opinion and everybody's phone call, man, I'd have quit a long time ago. But I don't serve Jesus for people. I serve Jesus for Jesus. Hallelujah. And I think he's worth serving. What do you think? Yeah, amen. amen. Now, verse 29, they, 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 they kept on prophesying all the way up to the evening. Neither avoid, no, 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 Baal didn't answer. Baal didn't, didn't respond. Now, watch what happens in verse number 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. Now, that's interesting. Elijah gave these, these false prophets all day long. And then he said, now after they had made, them, made a mockery of themselves, after they had cut themselves and bled on the altar and bailed and respond, and they did it all day long, Elijah calls the people to him and he says, come to me. Amen. You know what? God wants a people who do uh, come uh, to, to his preaching, to his preachers. Okay. Amen. Yes, that's right. To his preachers. Yeah. Amen. Verse number 30, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. Uh, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. So there was apparently already an altar at Mount Carmel. Uh, in fact, as I was researching it, it looked like maybe even Saul uh, Saul was responsible for building it, or at least being a part of it. In 1 Samuel 15, 12, the Bible references that Saul was at Mount Carmel, but, but uh, that's, I guess, a little bit of conjecture. But the point is, there was an altar that was already in Israel that was to the Lord, but watch what happened to the altar. It had been broken down because of verse number 30 says, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. You know, do you look around at American Christianity and think, man, there's a whole lot of altars broken down. Right. Amen. There's a whole lot of altars broken down. There's the Bible altar at home and it's broken down. People know more about country music in American Christianity than they do the New Testament of the Bible. And what a sad state of affairs. That altar was broken down. Who do you think broke it down? Who do you think inspired the breaking of the altar down? It had to be the devil through the false prophets, through people who wanted to live loose. All of these interactions come to pass and the people rise up at some point in their history and they broke down and they tore down the altar of the Lord. Now, now, amen. You know what? You can walk into a lot of churches and there's no altar to pray at, period. What have they done? They have torn down the altar of the Lord. They have taken it out. You know you can go into a lot of churches and they use 75 different verses of the Bible. And by the time they get done preaching, I went to a church probably 15 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, and the guy used seven different versions in one message, and I didn't know which way was up by the time I was done. You know what he would do? He would go and he'd find a verse that said this in this version, but he wanted to make this point, so he'd go and grab the version that made the most sense to his point, and he said, well, let's read it out of the Amplified. Let's read this point out of the New King James. Let's, yeah, because good. words have meanings, and, and words say, they say different things, or they mean different things, and so that's what he would do. I was confused, and that was 12 years ago. Guess what? We have torn down the altar of the King James Bible, and it's about time we put it back in our home. Yeah, sure. It's about time we put it back in our pulpits. Amen. 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 It's about time we put it back before our, our, our eyes. Uh, we have broken down the altars uh, in America of preaching the gospel and preaching truth uh, and, and speaking the word of God and speaking truth because we want to be liked. We want to be popular. We want to build a big church. We want to be the best preacher, the, 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 the most liked preacher. And so we torn down that altar. Now listen, listen to this. In the days when they tore down the altar, there had to be a group of people who tore it down. But don't you know there also had to be a group of people who didn't want it torn down. Yeah, right. There had to be. 
Why? Because God always has a people. God always has a remnant. Even when Elijah said, I'm the only one remaining, God said, wait a minute, y'all, you don't know this whole story. I got 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. There's got to be a people, even in the midst of a generation that tears down the altar, there's got to be a remnant of people who says, wait a minute, I don't want the altar torn down. And I think, by the way, that is all you folks. Hallelujah. People who do not want the altar torn down. Don't don't preach to me some milk toast and uh, cream puff sermon. Tell me the truth. Amen. Tell me the Bible. Tell me what's right. Amen. So they tore down on the altar. Maybe we in American Christianity have torn down the altar a little bit as well. What do you think? So Elijah goes over and he, he repairs the altar that was already there. He repairs it. It was broken down. He did it in front of all the people. So much so to indicate that this is the answer to Israel's problem. A return to the altar. Amen. Now Elijah's the prophet. He's pointing them that direction. Oh, there's a king. He's pointing him in the opposite direction. Uh, there's the prophet who's pointing him in the right direction. God uses people, no question. But the truth is we need to return to the altar. We need to return to Jesus. We need to return to the truth. Don't you think? Yeah. Amen. 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 Anybody have any thoughts tonight? All right. Well, we're going to keep going then. So let's see what he does in verse 31. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the, of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. So Elijah grabbed 12 stones up. Now the 12 stones represented the 12 tribes of, uh, of Israel, the 12 tribes of the sons of Jacob. So one stone for each tribe. Let's say there were um, 12 families that went to this church. Uh, and so, so we, let's say we were in the story, we'd take one, one tribe, one stone for this family, and another stone for this family, and it was representing all the families of the church that made up the church. And Elijah takes these 12 stones and watch what he does with them in verse number 31. Uh, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. I, li I like Elijah. He looks at the people who have torn down the altar and he still calls them back to the proper place with God. Now, listen, I don't care what people, I don't care if people get mad at me. I don't, I don't care what people end up doing uh, to me, about me, for me, whatever. I'm, I'm always going to be the guy that points people back to the altar. Amen. Amen. I'm always going to be that way. And I'm not going to stop now. I'm going to point people back to the Bible, back to church, Amen. back to the truth, right. back to kneeling before right. God back to being thankful. That's our job. Even if people in this generation have torn down so many authors that you don't even know if it's redeemable anymore, guess what? You still point them back to Jesus. You never know what God might do. And as far as I'm concerned, in many, many ways, our country looks like it's in a mess, but you never know what God might do if somebody's bold and brave enough to point people back to the altar. Right. Amen. So, so Elijah gathered these 12 stones, and with them, he builds a, a new altar a different altar. And he, let's, look, let's look at verse 31. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be thy name. So he calls them back to be Israel, which, excuse me, which means a prince with God, a prince with God. So he, uh, somebody who has power with God. So he points them back to their beginning. He points them back to their origin. He points them back to where it all began. Where does it begin uh, in our country? Well, I think it begins with people who knew how to pray. What do you think? Yeah. You know what George Washington was? He was, he was a praying man. Yeah. You can read his prayer journals. He was a praying man. He knew how to pray. He bowed before God in prayer. Don't you think maybe we ought to point people back to that altar? Don't you think we ought to point them back to be Israel again? Back to be America again? Back to be patriots again? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Right, so Jason, oh, everything's all torn down. Yeah, I get it. But if Elijah pointed him back, then I'm going to point him back too. Right. Maybe God will have mercy and heal the land. You never Amen. know. Amen. That's right. If he doesn't heal the land, we're in big trouble. Right. But maybe he will. 
Right. So what do we do? We point people back. Yeah. We tell them to repent. We tell them to get right. We tell them to humble themselves before God and point them back to Jesus. So that's what Elijah did. He said, you shall be Israel. Uh, he said, in other words, take up your inheritance. Take up who God created you to you to be and to and be that. You are not a prince with God's plural. You are not, you don't have power with Baal. You don't have power with the gods. You have power with God. Amen. With the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He points them back to their origin. Verse 32. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Amen. He built an altar. So he repaired the first altar that they had torn down, and he builds a new altar with these stones that represent the families of the nation of Israel because everybody at Mount Carmel that day was a descendant from one of these tribes or another. And so he builds an altar, and he represents all the families of the nation. All the people are represented at this altar, uh, and he builds it in verse 32. And, the stones he, and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. So he takes, he takes these 12 stones and he builds an altar and then around the altar he carves out a trench. And, and it's a big trench. It will contain two measures of seed. And what's he doing? By the way, he just, remember the, the showdown is this. Whichever God responds by fire that's the God we should serve. Right. So, Baal's had 12 hours. They've been calling on Baal from morning till evening at this point. Baal's had 12 hours to get the job done. He's a, you see, he must be away texting somebody or something. <laughs> Baal ain't going to get it done. So, what's Elijah do? Eli now, 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 by the way, calling down fire from heaven uh, is, in the natural sense, an impossibility. Right. Right? Oh, yes. I've never called down fire from heaven. The only time I've ever got fire is when I lit a match. <laughs> Amen. And I do that quite frequently. Amen. I, if I got stuff out, I got burned. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Say, that, that, you know, never mind. So, so at any rate, uh, he, 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 he builds this altar and then he digs a trench about the altar. Uh, and the, the, the calling down of fire is impossible in the natural. And he builds a trench, verse 32. Watch what happens in verse 33. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces. So he builds an altar. He sets up the stones. He puts wood on it. He digs a trench about it. And then he cuts the bullock and he addresses it. And he puts it on the altar because it's going to be a sacrifice to God. And by the way, God doesn't need a human sacrifice to respond. Uh, God, God is sufficiently uh, uh, happy without uh, you know, his promise cutting themselves and so forth. And, 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 and so Elijah builds this altar, verse 33, and he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Now, now if it wasn't impossible enough, to call down fire from heaven. By the way, that's impossible in right. the natural. We don't, right. uh, unless God does that, that doesn't get done, oh, right? Yeah. Uh, that's impossible in the natural. It's not impossible for the supernatural God to do it, but it's impossible for Jason to get it done. It's impossible in the natural. And then he takes uh, water and he says, fill full bed, four barrels of water and pour it. Watch what he says. He says, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice. It ain't burnt yet, but he's calling it the burnt sacrifice because he knows that God is going to respond. He knows God is going to answer. He knows God is not going to let him down. So even though there's no fire yet on that sacrifice, I'll pour a bunch of water on top of it and call it burnt sacrifice because right. God ain't going to let me down. Amen. I've discovered right. throughout my life God doesn't let me down. Amen. Right. People let me down. Things let me down. Situations right. let me down. But God never has ever, ever, ever let me down. Amen. So he knew God wasn't going to let him down. He also knew God put him up to this. And by, by the way, if God puts you up to something, he ain't going to let you down. Right. He didn't want to tell you you do it. He can, God's going to get it done. So he, pour, he pours water, four barrels of water on the sacrifice. Verse number 33. He calls it a bird sacrifice and on the wood. So there's wood to be consumed by fire. There's the meat to be consumed by fire. There's a sacrifice to be consumed by fire. And then the water is, is poured on top of it. Watch what happens in verse 34. And he said, do it the second Time. Yes, now these people are all watching this situation and they've been out there for a long time and they've watched Baal worshippers do everything they could to lead the nation in the wrong direction and now here steps they, but they could 
could not get Baal to respond. And now here steps up Elijah to the plate. And Elijah says, guess what? I guess what's going to happen? I'm not only going to ask God to do something impossible. I'm going to make it one time more impossible and dump water on top of it. And then I'm going to make it two times more impossible. And I'm going to dump some more water on top of it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, 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 he said the, the second time, so that means if I'm reading this right, he's, that's got eight barrels of water on that thing by the time verse 34 turns around. Right. right. Sometimes you suffer a lot of defeat before you, before you get a victory. Right. And they did it the second time. And he said, he said, do it the third time. Amen. So now we've got four, eight, and twelve, if I'm doing my math correctly. And now we've got twelve barrels of water poured on the wood, poured on the, did I get my math right? Poured, yeah. on, poured on the wood, poured on the water, poured in the trench, poured on the sacrifice. What what does steam? What 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 puts out fire, these most types of fires? Water. 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 So what's Elijah doing? He's setting up this impossible situation to be so impossible that if it does happen, only God could do it. Right, right, right. Amen. Only God. Only God. Amen. Amen. There was another story, something like that, where uh, the children of Israel were standing at the Red Sea and Pharaoh's armies were coming around to kill them. Yeah. And they were at a situation where if, it, if, if they are delivered from this situation, it is only by the hand of God. Yeah. It is not then by the hand of man. It is not then by the hand of a king. It is not then by the hand of a court. It is not then by the hand of a president. It is then by the hand of of God. Yeah. Some, sometimes God allows things to look nearly impossible before He sends the fire. Yeah. Verse 34. And He said, do it the second time. Verse 34. He says, do it a third time. And they did it the third time at the end of the verse. And the water ran round about the altar and He filled the trench also with Water. water. That is a lot of water. Twelve barrels full. If I'm reading that right. Twelve barrels full. Completely saturated. Elijah didn't have to build a ditch. He didn't have to build a trench around the altar. He didn't have to tell them to put water on top of it. He didn't have to say. He, but I think he wanted them to know that when it happened, it was only by the hand of God. Right. And with that, We'll be dismissed tonight in the presence of the Lord. Thank Amen. You. Amen. What, what is the point of this story? Uh, the point of the story is have faith in God. Right. No matter what happens, right. have faith in God. Right. Right. Nothing's too hard for them. But this, we can relate that to what's going on in the country today. Whatever happens, got to have faith in God. That's right. Amen. You know, if you have ever, ever tried to light, a wet piece of firewood, totally impossible. You are not going to get it. Good point. Right. Like that's that's like that. Amen. That's God gets it. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah. Go ahead. That's good. I was thinking about how, how precious of a commodity that water barrels were. Yeah. Three and a half years of drought. No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a good point. I can see yeah. it. Wow. Yep. Fantastic point. Amen. That's true. Beautiful. Never, never considered that. Anybody else? All right, we're going to be dismissed in prayer. Uh, Shana Lynn, dismiss us in prayer, please. Tonight, Father.